Hello, my friends. A little while ago, I put out an episode, episode 8.2, about how Joseph enslaved Egypt. Around the same time I put out that episode, I had a discussion with some of my good friends over at The Word in Black and Red about the same passage. And it was such an amazing discussion, and we didn't agree on everything, and that makes it even better as far as I'm concerned. And so I've asked if I could share that episode with my followers, and they said we could. So it's actually a two-part. So here is the first part of our discussion about how Joseph centralized power. Quick show note, there is some explicit language and references in this episode. The following podcast is banned in the state of Florida for talking about a dangerous leftist book, the Bible. Like the Bible, this podcast contains frank discussions on sensitive topics, including sex, violence, and cursing. Please proceed with caution. Those who pay close attention to the poor are truly happy. The Lord rescues them during troubling times. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. They are widely regarded throughout the land as happy people. You won't hand them over to the will of their enemies. The Lord will strengthen them when they are lying in bed sick. You will completely transform the place where they lie ill. This is the word black and red. And welcome to The Word in Black and Red, where we read the Bible from a leftist and liberationist perspective to elucidate the way people of faith and their comrades can understand the Bible as the source of healing, love, and liberation for all people. I am your host, Micah Belong, the wise old llama and be joined today by the wonderful L, our longtime wonderful co-host, W. Scott McCandless, and the wonderful Matt, a.k.a. King Clefairy in the Discord. And Matt, I understand you've started a new project pretty recently? Yeah, um, so I call it Church of the Affirmation. It's a litur- liturgy writing project that has grown out of my schoolwork at seminary and uh, that I'm hoping to bring with me in the pastorate once I've completed the ordination process. Uh, it takes seriously the foundational principles regarding diversity and inclusion in our Book of Order, uh, basically, I'm writing liturgies uh, and liturgical elements with diversity and inclusion as a presupposed good, uh, especially as those goods relate to themes of liberation, uh, the welcome and affirmation of LGBTQ plus community, and accessibility of worship for all bodies and all brains. Uh, but I still want it to feel Presbyterian, so I'm holding these things in tension because I don't believe these themes are incompatible with Reformed theology and worship. Um, so I've started a WordPress um, and doing that was actually inspired by one of uh, W. Scott McCandless's podcast episodes. But that's at churchoftheaffirmation.wordpress.com. And this will come out after Lent. So if you want to go back and listen to the ways that uh, that Matt has led the Lama Pack community through one of these liturgies that I had the privilege of reviewing um, before it got before it got officially published. That is absolutely fantastic. Please go back and and check out the Lama Pack and the work that Matt has been doing with us on that. Um, and we are joined for the first time by someone who I have admired for a long time. I love that this podcast gives me an excuse to talk to brilliant people that I have loved uh, online for a long time. And we're joined today by Joshua Maria. Gar- Garcia um, uh, of TikTok fame and doing a a bunch of wonderful other things online. Joshua, could you tell me uh, a little bit about your political tendency, your religious background, and how we can connect with you? Sure thing. I describe myself as a Democrat in the sheets and a (laughs) socialist. I got it backwards. I describe myself as a Democrat in the streets and a socialist in the sheets. I would not want to be a Democrat in the sheets. Religiously, I grew up uh, in a Jewish and evangelical household, eventually found my way into sort of a more mainline but mystical Jewish world. I was studying to become a rabbi at Hebrew college when I had a conversion experience and converted to Christianity. Um, Currently, an Anglo-Catholic question mark Episcopalian uh, in discernment for the priesthood. And you can find me on TikTok, J. Maria Garcia or Joshua Maria Garcia. And you're also, you also have the website, jmariagarcia.com.org. Yeah. 
dot com. All right. I awesome. do not comprise a full organization. <laughs> you know, every time someone defines, I feel like I feel Anglo Catholic, and then someone defines what Anglo Catholic is, and I'm like, no, I'm not that. <laughs> and so I understand that question mark rather intimately. <laughs> I'm an Anglo Catholic if a non Anglo Catholic is defining it, but if another Anglo Catholic <laughs> is defining it, I'm definitely not that. All right, we will dive on in to this text uh, that is, I think, one of the most important texts to understand uh, in the book of Genesis. So we'll dive right on in. Genesis 47, 13 through 26. There was no food in the land because the famine was so severe. The land of Egypt and the land of Canaan dried up from the famine. Joseph collected all of the silver to be found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain, which people came to buy, and he deposited it in Pharaoh's treasury. The silver from the land of Egypt and from the land of Canaan had been spent, and all of the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes, just because the silver is gone? Joseph said, Give me your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock if the silver is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food for their horses, flocks, cattle, and donkeys. He got them through that year with food in exchange for all of their livestock. When that year was over, they came to him the next year and said to him, We can't hide from my master that the silver is spent, and that we have given the livestock to my master. All that's left for my master is our corpses and our farmland. Why should we die before your eyes, we and our farmland too? Buy us and our farms for food, and we and our farms will be under Pharaoh's control. Give us seeds so that we can stay alive and not die, and so that our farmland won't become unproductive. So Joseph bought all of Egypt's farmland for Pharaoh, because every Egyptian sold their field when the famine worsened. So the land became Pharaoh's. He moved the people from the cities from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he didn't buy the farmland of the priests, because Pharaoh allowed the priests a subsidy, and they were able to eat from the subsidy Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they didn't have to sell their farmland. Joseph said to the people, Since I've now purchased you and your farmland for Pharaoh, here's seed for you. Plant the seed on the land. When the crop comes in, you must give one-fifth to Pharaoh. You may keep four-fifths for yourselves, for planting fields and for feeding yourselves, those in your households and your children. The people said, You've saved our lives. If you wish, we will be Pharaoh's slaves. So Joseph made a law that still exists today. Pharaoh receives one-fifth from Egypt's farmland. Only the priest's farmland didn't become Pharaoh's. So here in this story, we have this the story that is in stark contrast to the silver that Joseph had just given back to his own brothers, right? They were seen as this form of mercy to the people who had so hurt him and so, um, so traumatized him and set him down this path. And yet we don't see the same sort of the same sort of mercy extended to the people of Egypt. Instead, we see the accumulation of wealth that is the same problem that we have existing under capitalism, that those who have the resources cause a problem to those who do not have the resources and then force them to give over their resources over time. First, in, in an earlier episode, you will remember that I was talking about the fact that empires often cause famines rather than, you know, just being cursed with famines, that the the British Empire caused the Great Potato Famine because they did not allow the people of Ireland to buy the wheat they were exporting uh, elsewhere, and they had to sub and they had to subside on potatoes that weren't enough. And when the blight came through, there was more than enough food in Ireland to feed everyone, but they couldn't eat the food that they were producing because of the empire. Likewise, in India, there was plenty of food being produced, but it caused a huge famine because that that food was being exported out of the country. In the same way, for seven years, Joseph had been, had been accumulating all of this wealth from throughout Egypt, taking away a huge portion of their grain, including their seeds, into these huge silos that could be held for later. And only when suddenly there was a shortage of food, because a ton of it had been taken from them, then the people didn't have enough food. And so they went and gave all of their silver, and then all of their livestock, and then all of their land, which made Pharaoh go from just this normal sort of ruler in the area, according to the mythos of the Bible, to suddenly the most supreme ruler in all of the ancient Near East, where not only did Pharaoh directly own 
all of the wealth of Egypt. Not only did Pharaoh directly own all of the livestock of Egypt, not only did Pharaoh own all of the farmland of Egypt, but Pharaoh now had the right to make anyone in Egypt a slave because of the accumulation of wealth that he had brought under his power, that Joseph specifically had brought under his power. And guess who reaps the the detriment of Joseph's actions, not just the Egyptians, not just foreigners, but this is a curse of the accumulation of power that Joseph brings down on his own family for the next 400 years because his greed and his accumulation of wealth causes the detriment of the people of Israel. And that is the foundation of why the the rest of this holy book written by an oppressed people is absolutely anti-capitalistic. Joseph is just a middle manager, too. Like, that's like the worst part about this. He does all this and it's not even his. He's not some warlord accumulating this for himself. It's for somebody else. The banality of bureaucratic middle management, lawful evil. Like, hate is a strong word, but I really, really, really don't like Joseph. Uh, Yeah, at at the same time, I would say... I mean, I absolutely understand exactly where you're coming from. And yet Joseph is supposed to be the good guy, right? He is the guy. Well, he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be. He's the guy who up until this point anyways, has acted with perfect integrity. You know, he's done the right thing even when it hurt him. That's, That's exactly the kind of leader you're supposed to want to lead us because... The reality is that disasters happen. Disasters are part of the life of this world, and that includes famines. And, you know, wouldn't it be great if you knew that a tremendous disaster was coming? Like this, this is this is the notion that's set up in the story, that you know a terrible disaster is coming. You've been given seven years warning. And what do you do? You put the best possible person in charge to mitigate all of the the bad effects of this disaster. I mean, just imagine if we had seven years warning before COVID happened or before. But we did. We did. We uh, did. They've been warning about global pandemics for forever. (laughs) This is what I'm saying. But even if you put the best people in charge of the response, guess what? The result is that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's what this story is telling us. It doesn't matter who's in charge. Even if the best person is in charge, that's what happens. It's almost like the the existence of power is the problem. I know you said Joseph is supposed to be the good guy, but based on my knowledge of all the other uh, patriarchs in our journey through Genesis, none of them are good guys. They may be the main characters, but none of them are good guys. I don't know that I would say Joseph is the best person to be in charge. Uh, My wife, who is a much better person than I, also doesn't really like Joseph. Uh, Elle is better than I am, too. (laughs) But I think I think Joseph is a company man, and I think he's always been a company man. And I think looking at the record of integrity, maybe not the record of integrity so much as this is the guy who has the company polo and shows up at all the company picnics and follows the rule book to a T. And so when he's so integrity, it hurts him. Integritous that it hurts him, it's because he believes in the company. Um, but you know, his track record, he narks on his brothers, right? Um, earlier in Genesis, Jacob sends him out and he comes back and he gives a bad report and his brothers are the ones out working in the field and he, you know, gets to be at home. He's, he's managing from afar. He's delegating. Um, and then he ends up in Potiphar's household and, you know, that, that integritous moment where he won't sleep with the wife. Well, because he's a company man, he's not going to embezzle, right? But then he ends up in prison because the company is going to look for a dupe. And he loves the company so much, so why don't you take the fall? And he ends up in prison, and then he ends up basically being the prison warden. Uh, so he's, you know, a narc there too. And now he ends up in this position uh, where he is he is absolutely caught up in, in the system. But I think he kind of likes it a little. 
whether he should or shouldn't. I think he has the utmost joy each time the people of Egypt are coming back to him and are like, we don't have any more silver and we're starving. And he's like, I'll take your livestock. <laughs> and the, <laughs> then I'll take your bodies. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and then I'll take your land and then I'll take your, your souls. Hee hee. Tee hee. It's the law. I'm doing everything by the book. I'm kind of I'm compelled by like two really diametrically opposing interpretations of this story, which is a testament to my Jewish background. One of them is the Ramban's uh, Nachmanides uh, interpretation that like yes, Egypt uh, yes Egypt is sort of this company that <laughs> Joseph really believes in, but he is sort of working within the system to. Uh, as a kind of subterfuge. I'm not saying that I necessarily buy this interpretation. Um, I just think it's in interesting and compelling for particular like close reading reasons. Um, the Ramban notices that in the verse, in verse 20, it says, so Joseph gained possession of all the farmland. And the Ramban notices that it doesn't say in that verse that he acquires the people. And so he interprets this as a kind of reluctance to require to acquire the people as well. Um, and sort of writes not exactly a midrash because it's too late for that, but a kind of reinterpretation of the text that this is a testament to Joseph's reluctance to play the game, um, which I thought was interesting. That's in complete opposition to modern uh, commentary by the Reverend Walter Russell Bowie, who's the commentator in the Interpreter's Bible, where he's basically like, Joseph is a fascist. And this is how fascism starts. And that was also, and his and his interpretation is is also really compelling where he kind of, he particularly addresses the idea that Joseph is acting mercifully and says, this can't really be possible. I think in, in my mind, when like reading the Bible, I'm looking for the opposing perspectives and then usually just sit in the tension. Like, I, I don't think one is right. I think they have different functions. I think there's a sort of need to understand what Joseph is doing from Joseph's perspective. I think the, I think Nachmanides gives us that perspective. And I think that at the same time, we have to decide how are we going to conduct ourselves in society. I think the commentary from the Interpreter's Bible gives us a better example of that. Fascism is bad. I think we can offer all of these different interpretations um, here, but even in those interpretations, we can we can leverage those, right? So I think that it, I think that it's Ramban who's also talking about Jacob and Esau and like how Jacob is not actually tricking Esau because he's finding what is rightfully his and like he's working within the logic of the system to to get what he deserved to have that he should have been the first out. Even if we take that Joseph is trying to use the system to bring about you know and trying to work through the system, right? Like we see this kind of argument from democratic establishment all the time, right? We're like, we have to work through the system to make things work in these ways. But the end result is the same sort of horrific catastrophes that, that we would see otherwise, right? Like, you know, we have to work within the system and that's why we're bombing the Houthis in, in Yemen, right? And that's why we're bombing the Palestinians, right? Or we're providing the, the bombs for Israel to kill all of these um, people in, in Palestine because we have to work within the system and the system includes committing genocide, right? And here, I think Bowie is exactly right. that like, we're existing within a system, but that system is on the decline, to dictatorial rule and fascism, right? And so, you know, when do we work within the system versus when do we resist it? Because if we had, if Joseph had instead resisted this and said, no, we're going to give out the food because everyone should survive a famine, like that seems, you know, even if you're only going to give it to the, to the Egyptians, that seems like <laughs> just as good of a solution to, to help people survive here. But instead, Joseph pursues this power that works within the system, right? Keeps his bosses happy, but results in the enslavement of his own family for, for generations. So I know that we've talked about how Joseph has, is possibly neurodivergent. And I've been reflecting on that as a neurodivergent person myself a little bit more. And like in reading this passage, it really jumped out at me that like, like a, a common thread among the neurodivergence, uh, we tend to have a strong sense of justice, but like whatever that justice is, that is not a universal justice among us all. That is influenced by like our, our environment, how we were raised, all of those things. 
and this so vibed as like the lawful evil well this is justice because this is how things should go this is like that's just it it vibed so hard for me in that way like and it it really reminded me of like a younger version of myself where like I believed in certain institutions like well if we do things this way that it's supposed to work and it like that's fair that's just like that's correct I'm glad I have a different sense of justice these days, but especially at the very end where he's like, after he's taken everything from these people and turned them into slaves and put them into lifelong debt and enslavement, he's like, well, you can keep four fifths of what you produce, but you have to buy your seeds from me and, you know... (laughs) We'll just take a fifth of what you make after you've uh, lost everything already. <laughs> Monsanto. <laughs> it's it's more than Monsanto. It's you know student debt. It <laughs> it's 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 the modern existence essentially. Like this this one super bothered me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I I mean I think it's uh, ultimately. I mean I would argue that maybe as I have, that maybe Joseph meant well, but ultimately it doesn't matter because one righteous person, if he's the righteous person and maybe isn't, one righteous person actually doesn't matter in all of this. The problem is the system, right? The system is corrupt and evil. I'm going to bring up Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, where she goes through various disasters that have happened in this world. She goes through the uh, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. She goes through Hurricane Katrina. And she documents how, as a result of these absolute disasters, the result was that the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. And that's what happens as a result of disasters, because that's how the system set up. And, and the rich and the wealthy and the elites are ready to take care of whatever disasters, take advantage of whatever disasters come up and make the most of it uh, in order to profit themselves. And like she wrote that in 2007. And what has been our history since? We've seen like, what what was it? The, the disaster 2008 when everything collapsed. And uh, even though it was caused by the wealthy elite, they got richer as a result of that. And everyone else got poorer. And then what has happened as a result of COVID? And I remember, do you remember those first days, those first months after COVID, where we were all saying, hey, everybody, look, we're all recognizing, you know, frontline workers, these low wage people, how important they are, how essential they are. We're going to totally turn around our society and recognize how important they are. And we're going to pay them appropriately and Here we are four years later, and what has happened as a result of that complete and utter economic disaster, the wealthy people got enormously more wealthy as a result of that, and everyone else got further and further behind. Uh, So Naomi Klein's absolutely right, and she could have taken the page exactly from Joseph in in the book of Genesis, because that's exactly what happened in this famine. Uh, yeah, as a result of one disaster and hope, I hope at least, you know, good intention of trying to get things ready to deal with this disaster. Um, everyone ended up worse off except for the wealthy and the elite. And it's not because Joseph, I think, did it on purpose. I think it's the system and the system is the market, Right. Egypt had food. There were people outside, wanted to food. They had gold. They were willing to pay for it. Why on earth would you give it to these Egyptians who actually gave you the food in the first place when you can sell it to these foreigners for lots and lots of money? So that's the system. And the system is corrupt. It's not the individuals. That really is feeding into Elle's point on lawful evil, right? Like, you aren't evil for believing the system should work, right? But it is a little bit evil when you see the consequences of the system and you still say it should work that way. Like, you know, like we we protesting that student debt should be forgiven because Biden fucking promised it would be. Um, But, you know, (laughs) these these people who are choosing between 
uh, repaying their debts or paying for their children to go to school or, you know, paying for their children to not have lunch debt or paying for their children to have a meal. Right. And and the lawful evil is to say, oh, well, I paid off my debts, so you have to pay off your debts, too. Right. Uh, Despite the fact that they are tremendously more and you got tremendously less for the amount that you paid for it. Right. Um, And there, you know, I have friends who went to a private university um, who didn't complete their degree and so are not eligible for any of the repayment programs because they weren't able to finish the degree because it was too expensive to go and they couldn't afford to take out more loans to go there. And so they're stuck in this in this double bind of not making enough money to repay the loans and not being able to go back to school because they can't get enough loans. And to say that those people deserve to be where they are because of those consequences that is 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 following the law to a point of evil of hating your neighbor instead of caring for them and wishing for their best well it's it's following the system because like okay i'm being sarcastic here but like your friends micah they should have known a private institution is for rich kids they're not supposed to go there on loans if you're not rich i think that's a great parallel back to what Joseph does here and how when we get to the book of Exodus, the slavery that the Israelites are in, uh, because the, you know, your friends who are in debt, I'm in debt. A lot of people are in debt for student loans right now is, isn't necessarily because of choices we made, but that goes back to decades of policy decisions um, so Reaganomics is is kind of the big change there where there was a lot of student aid that was available to make education free. And uh, Roger Freeman, I have this in my notes for the show, um, he was a Stanford economics professor. He was an advisor to Nixon and, and later he advised Reagan and actually warned him against having an educated proletariat, said we need to limit who gets access to education um, so they, you know, he slashed state aid, Reagan slashed state aid when he was governor. He did the same thing as president. And so aid became debt. And so now, now we have a crisis down the line because of these policies farther back where, you know, what, what other choice is there to make sometimes? It's Joseph Nomics. Aid is debt. <laughs> Not to argue the complete opposite thing of what I said earlier. I think it's really interesting where we decided to like start and end the reading. Because if you look like a couple verses before and a couple verses after, it does become kind of hard to imagine that Joseph isn't doing this on purpose. In verse 11, it says that Joseph settles his family in the choicest parts of Egypt. And then in verse 27, after our reading, it reminds us that that's what happens. And so... After this kind of like really enveloping this, uh, what 10 or so verses of Joseph kind of sucking up all the land into Pharaoh's vacuum, right? It's, we're reminded on either end of that sort of bookending that, that it's his family that eventually settles in these choicest parts. And so it, it is, it's kind of hard to imagine that Joseph's not really conscious of what's going on. And I think it does complicate the sort of, the image I have of him here. Uh, for people who subscribe to JEPD, I can't remember the actual name of it, um, but that theory of, of how the Torah came Documentary hypothesis. I yes. thought that was maybe it, but I didn't want to say it wrong. Um, you know, that kind of bookending is one of the things that indicates that someone threw a story in the middle there from a different source. And so I find that very interesting because sometimes... Uh, like there's two different stories going on of Noah's flood and you have redactors who are just, we have these two stories we need to mash them together and make them sense, make them make sense. And then sometimes you have stories that say, "Mm, I have a different opinion about this person or this thing that happened and I'm going to shove it right in there uh, to provide commentary. And so that almost to me reads as, you know, from a different source saying, okay, so Joseph came and brought his family into the choicest of lands. That's wonderful. But those are lands that he confiscated from the people of the land. And I'm going to make sure that you know that. So I'm going to shove this story 
right into the middle of that so that so that you have no illusions you know exactly where that land is coming from and goshen and goshen is notably not the city right goshen the is this lush area yeah exactly it's 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 the height of suburbia now it's 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 the best farmland right for flocks and for so pasture. like and in yeah, for past year, exactly. So I, I know that Al has lots of thoughts on cities. And so I want to, I just want to emphasize the fact that, that Joseph brings all these people and after they've taken away their farmlands, after he's taken away their traditional modes of living, suddenly they're thrown into cities, much like the Industrial Revolution would bring about and and fundamentally change the way that people had existed for hundreds of years when the commons were a thing that people could go and farm uh, in shared capacity. And suddenly that was all privatized and cities became the only ways of people to really make a living. It reminds me of after the Civil War, where you have all these people becoming sharecroppers and then all the, like all the white sharecroppers being lured into cities and factory towns to become like very low paid and abused workers within that system. But it, they like after Joseph took their like like took these people's land that they were like subsisting on and they couldn't subsist on anymore. He's like, come to the city, come be a builder. And then what like, that's a much worse backbreaking existence. And like these cities, you know, they didn't have the kind of industrial pollution that the earth, like the, the late 19th century did, but they, it's, it's, they had plagues. They, it sucked. Like you were in close quarters. There were giant rats everywhere still. Well, and, and diseases, right? Sewage and diseases should not be undercounted. Sewage and disease. Well, that that was that was high peak peak late nineteenth century. Also, lots of diseases and smells and rats. Ancient cities were disgusting. We really glorify. I mean, I remember I was a classics major undergrad, and I remember fellow students saying, "I wish I could live in Athens." And my professors would be like, you have no idea what you're talking about. Like, you need to really examine that. <laughs> like, there, there's a reason perfumes were so valued, and it is not to smell nice. It's to, like, to dab under your own nose. Like, it's, the, it's, it's that scene in Silence of the Lambs where Clarice, like, puts the, the like, Vicks vapor rug before she, like, encounters the dead body, the, the corpse. This is such a distracting point but i'm gonna make it anyway it, this actually might be why uh incense is so important to ancient ritual is that there's so many things going on around these temple centers that smell horrible that you can't focus on anything spiritual unless you're really doing something else to overpower that smell and so there's even there's even stories in the talmud about the incense of the temple like being so powerful and pungent that it would like no one would need to wear perfume in Jerusalem because you could smell the temple everywhere. So I think there was an awareness that like, yeah, that's there for a reason. It's not just bells and smells. There's a whole lot of blood pooling and and dead meat lying around for sure. Yes. Well, and that's why priests need subsidies, right? They got to pay. They got to pay for it. It was connected all along. Cinnamon is very expensive. If you smell Mid Middle Eastern oud, it is also very pungent. And I really enjoy it for that reason. But it is something that smells very strongly because you have to have like it. it and it, it develops out of that, right? Is that the, it, way back when it used to be the way of covering up those sorts of smells. The thing that I really like um, comes from a just related to this comes from Tattoos on the Heart by Gregory Boyd, uh, Father Gregory Boyd, where he writes um, a little passage about a parish that he was leading and the fact that they had decided that they were going to start taking homeless people in and allowing them to sleep there overnight. And they came in, came in one Sunday and, you know, the, the people had, had just left and 
and someone came in and said and complained, it smells like feet in here. It smells gross um, in here. And as someone who works with homeless people and is blessed to not have a great sense of smell, a lot of the time that doesn't bother me. Um, but every once in a while, like I, I can smell someone who hasn't been able to shower in a long time because they haven't had access to it, right? Because they've been turned away. Because in my city, there's only one public restroom that people can go to without having to buy something, right? There are no public showers except for those provided at the at the one shell center for homelessness um, in the city. Unless you're in a program, you're not able to get clean a lot of the time. And in this story uh, that Gregory Boyd tells, you know, these, these people who are complaining and say, oh, I don't want to do this anymore because they're smelly, they're outsider, and, and suddenly it, it, it doesn't smell good. How am I supposed to worship God when this happens? And one of the little old lady says, it smells like roses. It smells like Jesus. And that just radically reframes all of these things because Jesus did not get to have a shower very often. <laughs> Jesus was a homeless man who walked around and said, where will the son of man lay his head? Or the son of man has no place to lay his head. And, and Jesus would have been smelly and Jesus would have been smelly on the cross. And all of those things are part of our experience. And so the next time you smell someone who doesn't smell very good, let's stop and say, oh, that's Jesus right there. <laughs> That's why they were always washing his feet. Yeah. They were like, oh, you're so stinky, Jesus. You got athlete's foot. Um, <laughs> the institution of cities. The reason the, the cities exist and be come to exist because they are centers of power, right? The, the, when you had more nomadic tribes, there were less structure in a society. But when you began to build cities, you began to have dynamics of power put into place the local religion the people who have to run the sewers the people who run whatever healing facilities are there um, the institutions of the city gain power and they therefore gain some authority over people as well and so here we see this mythos developing how Egypt is structured entirely. Now, of course, we know that this didn't happen over the course of one dude's lifetime, right? But within the mythos of the story, Pharaoh goes from being a fairly wealthy, but like, you know, neutralish power among many leaders of Egypt to being the one central power, the one fascistic power, that rules over all of these. And one of the ways that that happens is the bringing of people into the cities. I think part of bringing them into the cities is also, it breaks their connection to the land and which, which they are very concerned about when they, when they come to Joseph, they are, they express to him a concern, I think in verse 19 about the land itself dying. It's not just like will die. It's like our land will die if we're not cultivating it. And so there's a, there's a kind of, there's almost an, an uh, animistic kind of connection to the land here. Ibn Ezra points this out and uh, and supports their assertion that the land can die with Nehemiah 9, 6, where God is praised for enlivening the earth. And I, and I think I think moving them into the city is kind of a way to do that, to like make not only the people, but the land into an object that can be owned. And I, and I think along with that would go a loss of community. You know, anytime you see that historically, when people move from a rural setting into the urban setting, one of the big losses is that sense of community and belonging. And that is huge in terms of mental health and overall health for the people who make that transition. I was going to extraction is the word I would want to use for all of that. So the grain being extracted from the farmlands. It's coming to the city. It's being sold uh, elsewhere. I don't think that's in this passage, but it's being sold to other countries. Um, people are being ex extracted from their communities and the community suffers from that resource being pulled out as well. And probably also these are ancestral. Uh, you know, these lands have been passed down for who knows how long, how many generations these have been in families. And so it's it's that connection that goes back uh, that is suddenly being severing uh, severed as well. So so a modern parallel I really see is how how much land in the United States is like at risk for wildfires. 
So in ancient Egypt, like this is all flood land and that does have to like if you're using it for agriculture, you do need to have like a hand in taking care of it. Otherwise, it just it becomes like completely wild and like it's going to be less inhabitable for people in general because things can get out of hand during those floods. There's levee, there's breaks, there's like irrigation that gets done and ancestrally like native americans would like actually caretake the land and like do controlled burns and like all that underbrush would be taken care of and now we have all this beautiful american manifest destiny and private property and you know the entire state of california goes up in flames every summer you know like that's just happening now and it's happening in far more places too because like, you know, like 10 individuals own millions and millions and possibly billions of acres that like used to just be roamed on and taken care of just because people saw that it needed to be needed to be taken care of. It's interesting. We can think of extraction as taking resources out or we can think of extraction as taking something away from people too. And just in the language of this text, the, the words that are chosen in the Hebrew to talk about bodies, to talk about animals, to talk about acquisition, they're, they're really soulless words. Biblical Hebrew doesn't usually word, use words like givia, corpse, to talk about a person, right? Like that's not, that's not what we're used to hearing. But also for the animals, it uses the term mikne, which is just translated usually like cattle in our Bibles, but it really means acquisition. It comes from the verb kana, which means to acquire. And so it's even, it's describing the animals as these soulless acquisitions too. And so the word extraction strikes me as really important here because not only are these things being taken away from the people, but the soul is being taken out of the animals, out of the land, out of the people, even their bodies in just a really striking way. I don't want to like drive us off in a different direction, but there's some wordplay on that too, because the, the Hebrew verb kana is used for a lot of different things. But I suspect there might be some implication here that, that Joseph is kind of, what's the word, like conscripting the people into a kind of marriage acquisition with him. The same verb is used for marriage in Hebrew. And there's some suggestion when they ask for seed that they're asking for the consummation of the marriage. And so it gets a little sexy at the end if you want to go there. I mean, that's not that's not too far off from an from an analogy to marriage in the ancient Near East. Um, but I, I love that the way that you're talking about that, Joshua, where it's like there is alienation from the very souls of the thing there that like there is a greater life to to these things where it's not they're not talking about their bodies. They're talking about their corpses, you know, that that strikes me as as extremely alienating the same sort of alienation that we see under capitalism where you know we are the ones who produced these things the 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 people who worked in Egypt are the ones who produced the 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 grain that they're now begging Joseph to give back to them he's simply taken from them and and now he's giving it back to them only at the expense of the rest of their lives and the connection that they once had to the land to the livestock to their homes to themselves Thank you, Elle, Matt, Scott, and Joshua Maria. We so appreciate y'all being on this podcast. Now, dear listeners, stick it out because part two is coming and it is even more fantastic of a conversation. So please join us for that conversation, which will be in your feed next week. Now, past Micah, take it away. Thank you, future Micah. And of course, you, our wonderful listener. Together, we have made a wonderful and growing community on Discord that I look forward to being a part of every day. Your generous support on Patreon has already greatly increased the quality of our podcast, including this very outro. As an extra little thank you, you can get episodes early along with a bunch of other cool perks. Please follow the link in the show notes to join our Discord, Patreon, and all of the other things mentioned throughout this episode. If you would like to reach me directly, you can reach me through the Discord or by email at thewordinblackandred at gmail.com. Now, future Micah, say the profound shit. And thank you, past Micah. Now go, and form a union, so that you can get what you deserve, and that together we can build the kind of world that we are called to build. Shalom. Shalom.